Welcome to Parenting Special Needs Live. Um, I'm Shantae, and in today's family chat, we will be talking about navigating transitions across the lifespan. Um, do you kind of cringe when you hear the word transition? <laughs> I do. I think we all do. Today, our panelists um, from coast to coast will be chatting um, family to family about navigating their real life um, transition experiences. And we would like all of you to share with us as well. So, you know, add them to the comments. Together, we're going to see how we can use positive behavior support um, in these situations to help us. And as the great oldie but goodie song, probably many of you don't know, or but the Brady Bunch um, was, when it's time to change, you've got to rearrange. And so I think we're all really good at that or we're gonna learn to be, right? Woohoo! So um, I wanna put a question out there to the audience. Uh, so what brought you here tonight? Um, what are some transitions your loved one is facing right now? You know, it could be such as moving, uh, starting a new school, graduating from high school, um, you know, and we also want to ask what are some considerations you've made to support your loved one through the transition. So let us know in the comment box um, and, you know, we're going to try to make sure that we help. We have, uh, you know, these family chats are led by and sponsored by parents and professionals. So we have a vast um, experience and knowledge here to share with us. Um, some of our sponsors are Home and Community Positive Behavior Support Network, Parent to Parent USA, the Partnership for People with Disabilities at Virginia Commonwealth University, Positive Behavior Supports Corporation, and Parenting Special Needs Magazine. So thank you to all of our sponsors and all of these family and experts that are here to share with us. Um, I'm going to let each of the panelists introduce themselves. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce myself. Um, again, I'm Shantae with Parenting Special Needs Magazine. Um, and I came here today as a parent and a mom um, to share with, to ask about um, traveling and taking vacations. Um, I need a little help with this, so I'm going to see if we can get some help. So uh, I'm going to pass the microphone on or the pretend microphone on to Molly. So Molly, uh, you take it away and introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm Molly Dellinger Ray from the Partnership for People with Disabilities at Virginia Commonwealth University. And what I don't like transitions at all, uh, even tiny little transitions, but I'm also a planner. And so I anticipate transitions as much as I can because I know they're gonna be difficult for me. So I'm returning to face-to-face -to -face work. So that's a transition for me. And I was just sharing with the group that even things like getting a new version of the phone that you've already had is a hard transition for me. Uh, we also have Rebecca who's in the chat and she's got an adult child going to college in about two weeks. Wow. So I'm gonna pass things down over to Marsha. Hi everybody, um, I'm Marsha Quinn. I'm co-executive director for Parent to Parent USA. And I'm here more as a parent than a professional tonight. I have two boys with autism and I can relate to you. My, my son just left for college last week. So I'd love to talk to you about that transition and, and also transitions with my older son who has um, approached the cliff as we call it here in Washington state and talk about some transitions to adulthood for him. So I'm gonna pass it to, I don't see the screen of who's next for me. So I'm gonna just jump out of order here and I'm gonna pass it to Tara. Okay, well, thank you, Marsha. Um, my name is Tara Cessna. I work with Positive Behavior Supports Corporation. I'm a board certified behavior analyst, and I'm here because I've, I've worked for the last 20 years helping families go through the transitions of life stages, um, all that, that encompasses from like womb to tomb, what, what's going on in your life. And I want to help in any way that I can um, offer some suggestions or strategies. And so happy to be on this panel. And I will then pass mine to um, Marsha Quinn, or no, excuse me, Claudia Axelrod. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I am a parent of three kids, and my younger son, who's now 18, um, was diagnosed with autism at age of two, and I decided to become a behavior analyst. 
to try to help them. And long story short, I uh, I now also work for Positive Behavior Supports Corporation as one of their clinical directors. Um, and I am here in both capacities, but mainly to, like Marcia said, mainly to tell you guys my stories um, uh, of, and, and share with you any knowledge that could uh, hope, uh, hopefully uh, help you in your transitions in their lives. And I will pass it to Laura. Hi, I'm Laura Kern. I'm a professor at um, University of South Florida, um, but I am here tonight because I'm also a parent of a child with special needs, autism, ADHD, and anxiety. And we are prepping this week hardcore for return to school. He's going to be a junior and he is already starting to do his freaking out of, um, I don't want to go back. So hopefully you guys have some ideas to share. If anybody is also transitioning back to K through 12, please share that with the chat because we're, we're covering the gamut this tonight. We also have Melody with us and she has a 21 year old on the CDC waiver who's aging out of school and medical child Medicaid. So we'll be able, a lot of us will be able to relate to you, Melody. And let's go to Flip. Hi, everyone. Good night. Uh, and good evening. <laughs> Not good night. Uh, we want you to stay around. Um, I also work with Molly at Virginia Commonwealth University as a partnership for people with disabilities. I'm a co-director of the Center for Family Involvement, which means I get to do what I love best, and that's share uh, my family experience uh, with others. So I am also the mom of a child uh, who is turning 18 on Thursday. Mm -hmm. And we already have a, a couple of folks uh, on Facebook who are chiming in and stating that they're here because um, they're working on self-direction or their child is going into high school and they're missing their best friend that's been with them for since third grade. So mm -hmm. I hope that we can touch on all of that. Wow, great. There was something that Rebecca typed earlier. Rebecca had, uh, had said that uh, she has an adult with, that is going into college in two weeks. So congratulations for that. Yeah. That's excellent. And, you know, I, I hear a lot of the stories in the chat, and it's great that a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight is going to really hit home with a lot of you. We have individuals that are, you know, fading out of services that are transitioning into different programs and schools. And, you know, we're just trying to navigate together, you know, what are the best ways to find those resources? And what we want to talk to you tonight are some of those transition strategies, such as, you know, what are they? Um, these are used to support our loved ones during times of change, during times of, of difficulty, um, and, you know, different disruptions to our activities or our settings. And they're used to increase predictability to create those positive routines. So a lot of what you'll hear tonight is the, the preventative, the proactive strategies we use to anticipate how our loved ones may struggle through certain um, you know, situations and what we can do to help dissolve some of those problem behaviors. Um, and you know, we'll be talking about strategies that are either presented verbally, such as a reminder, hey, we're gonna leave them all in five minutes. Auditorily, a timer can be set. That's that transitional prompt that just says, okay, it's time for me to get out of bed, for example, or those visual prompts where we're looking at um, you know, words that can be presented to help us get through those transitions of our day. Um, and they can be used before, during, or after a transition. So a lot of what we talk about tonight is going to be centered around these transition strategies. And our panel is gonna share some amazing stories with you. And I wanna start, um, you know, when we think about lessons and experiences, Flip, you mentioned your daughter turning the big one eight on Thursday. I'd love to hear from you, you know, what are some of the transition struggles that you've been going through? What are some of the like lessons that you've learned? How can you help the team here? Um, that are joining us tonight. I'm happy to share that story. So thank you. Um, and really, I'm hoping that the team here um, will help let me know what I did right, what we did wrong, where we can we, we can improve. So uh, yeah, 18 on Thursday. And to say the least, it's been a very eventful last few months. Um, doing all the things that adults do, plus some because she has disabilities. Um, I've felt a lot like Aladdin, trying to 
keep uh, one step ahead of it all. Um, we were hit, um, or we were a hit at DMV recently. So that's one of the th many things that we've been doing. Um, I know DMV is not anyone's favorite place unless you're a huge Monsters, Inc. fan and you're hoping that you're going to meet Roz. But um, it's a great example of going and trying something new, um, something out of daily routine. So needless to say, we made it lively. <laughs> um, thanks to COVID policies, we were at the window pretty quickly. So that wasn't an issue. Um, and she was answering questions and she was providing proof of her existence. And then she started to become curiouser and curiouser about the little cubicle space that we were in. And boom, she's on the floor in a panic. Um, whole room was watching us. And that's when our little marathon began. So uh, from the window to the car with sweat dropping down my brow. And I'll leave the racier story for Claudia. But Back to our race, um, we were three laps in and out of the DMV. With me having my fingers, toes, and my eyeballs crossed that they were gonna hold this window. Uh, the clerk immediately had her supervisor as a backup at the window checkpoint. Security was standing and keeping up with our pace. Uh, patrons were spectating and some were encouraging with cheers as we passed. <laughs> Uh, through the halfway point and the vestibule. So it ended up that the camera had set her off because flashing lights caused um, triggers for her seizures and also for her anxiety. On the final lap back to the window, she agreed to give the photo finish. So snap. The clerk looked at me and said, no, her eyes are closed. We have to have them open. So I took a deep breath. I stood beside the camera. I was like, all right, nothing to lose here. We're already being watched. So I got as animated as I could get, as you could probably see from me telling the story. And I just looked at her and I was like, come on, lady, big eyes, big eyes, you can do it. I heard the click. She and I both heard, got it. And that was it. She was gone, out the door. While I'm standing there trying to get the rest of what we need together, the clerk had handed me a stack of post-it notes and was just shouting out like the information she needed. And I'm writing it down and smacking it on the window. I get it done. I'm like, are we good? She's like, yeah, we're good. All right. <laughs> Sigh of relief in scene. I go out to the car, open the doors, and all I can hear is the blaring sound of my car alarm. Because she had set that off and she was blaming somebody else. <laughs> the point is even the best made plan can go awry. So ahead of this appointment, we went over and over the process, the environment, the need for patience, that she had a comfort item paperwork and even having the really difficult conversation about organ donorship. So with all of that, I'm going to pitch it back to y'all. What did we do right? What could we have done better? I love your story, Flip. Um, what I think is so helpful these days, and we're so lucky that we have YouTube, right? I, I am able to rehearse so much with my families now, showing them the DMV on YouTube and the process that it takes and what the lines look like how long they might have to wait for, setting timers, um, and really helping them to, to, to rehearse it in their safe environment, um, but watching it visually. And they can do that over and over again in their own comfort, like a desensitization type training. Um, that's you know been helpful for me, for some of my families. What, what I love in that story is the, the one variable that you cannot control is everybody else in the room. And it sounds like that DMV worker and those other DMV customers were cheering her on and, and wanted to help make this happen and were fully invested in the process. And I just love that. I think that sometimes we think like, 
this is going to be awful. I'm going to make a scene. Everyone's going to be looking at me. This is going to be so embarrassing. When in truth, everybody wants this to work. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of um, anxiety and stress surrounding, oh my gosh, this is going to be so horrible. When in fact, it's great. Molly, you're so right. When I drove up, I already had it in my head that schedule this appointment and if it didn't work we can reschedule but thankfully things aligned and it worked out <laughs> we're so fortunate that that worked out for your daughter flip and it's because you know you persevered and you didn't let it get to you when when you knew you had to you know take out all the stops you did and and you didn't let it affect you so you know kudos to you because i know that's not easy to put yourself out there when everybody's you know really watching what you're doing and, and speaking of putting yourself out there, I kind of want to bring it to Marsha because Marsha is going to talk about, you know, the pandemic. And now we have services that are that we've had for all these years that are no longer available for our loved ones. And Marsha, like, what did you do during that time? How did you help navigate the pandemic? Well, so um, like I mentioned, I have two boys with autism and their ages will kind of define where I'm going with my story. Um, one, my older son, Camden, was 21 when pandemic hit. So 21 last March, and he was in his last year of transition. So he had six more months to go. And my younger son was uh, in September of 2020, who he's also on the spectrum and has um, more anxiety and OCD. He was preparing to go away to his freshman year in college, five hours away. So all this is taking place in the middle of a pandemic where we as parents, it's our worst fear, one, of COVID, of taking our children anywhere and of getting it. I ended up getting COVID, which was another thing that happened in 2020. And luckily, nobody in my house got it. But what did happen was for Camden, my oldest, we reached the cliff, as I called it. And um, I live in Washington State. And services here for adults with disabilities is minimal. And although I have a waiver and I have Medicaid and I have, you know, primary um, insurance, I I'm not able to find respite people that want to come to our house during a, a, a pandemic. Two, I don't want anybody coming to my house during a pandemic. And here I have a nonverbal son with zero services and I and I work you know as in parent to parent luckily I work half time so I think what I've learned is that I didn't plan very well I felt like I had that last six months that I was depending on doing those planning things that it just I fell off that cliff and I literally at this point in time it, it, he's not in my room right now with me but everybody on this panel has met Camden or seen Camden in a meeting because he's either knocking on the door or asking me for his video or TV or iPad, you know, his limited um, needs. But I think that um, a lesson learned is that you really need to plan for that cliff and for that transition. And um, another transition that happened with Camden was healthcare. And so it's another buzz thing for us with adults with disabilities. You, you have to cut the cord from that children's hospital and that autism neuro neurologist that was a pediatric neurologist and, and his epilepsy doctor, he also has epilepsy. So there was all this transition to adult care and dental and everything, you name it, med, psych. I was not prepared for any of that. And I live, I work in the profession. I mean, this is what I do for a living. <laughs> and I, I didn't have a mentor or a peer support person to help me with it. I navigated it on my own. I'm still in the midst of it and it's, it's a struggle. It's not easy. And I, I understand there's a couple of people on this call that are in the same chapter that I'm at this adulthood. I know flip, you know, you're hitting that 18 mark and you're talking about guardianship and you're talking about all this transition stuff and the organ transplant question at the DMV for my younger son. I totally forgot about that, but he freaked out. What? Who would, who would do that? They just don't have that empathy piece that would be like, oh yeah, I'd want to save somebody else. No, no, autism, you know, he didn't get that at all. But um, I think, you know, and then somebody asked about the whole transition to college. I want to let you know that it's doable. Your kid can go to college. He, my son, he didn't know how to do laundry. I taught him how to do laundry at his dorm when I dropped him off. 
I took him down to the laundry room and taught him how to do it right there and then. And he's so methodical that it just took once for it to stick. But he also is a picky eater and he has major anxiety and OCD and all of these things in the middle of a pandemic. And he had the most stellar year of his entire life. I mean, it, yeah, I agree. They do have empathy, but I think I should be talking about my 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 boys and my family in general. So sorry to generalize that. Um, but the whole transition to college was a huge success. And I think that I, I'm going to keep using this term, cutting the cord. I think that I needed to let go and let him be independent and do it on his own. And I'm I'm a little bit of a helicopter mom. I never was before, but now that he's away, I'm I'm a little, you know, calling and, and probably messaging him more than I should be. But um, it's remarkable what you can do when you actually uh, empower your kids to, to do things independently like I have with my younger son. So I'm just kind of curious if, you know, if anybody has any other experiences with, with these transitions or challenges and what the panel would like to tell me because I'm not a positive behavior support specialist and I could use some coaching because somebody else, one of my friends is going to ask me about what to do with this transition. And I'm going to say, I'm not, I didn't do very good at it. So <laughs> if, if anybody here has some advice for me, I would, I take it wholeheartedly open, open book here. Well, first, I, I just want to say this. I, I want to give you credit for saying that you didn't do very well. I mean, you have a son that is away at college. I mean, oh, many people can't say that. And, and it's hard for us as parents to even allow for that. I think it's our own fear and anxiety for the unknown, for, you know, God forbid they get hurt. So many things can happen, but you're trusting that you've given him enough foundation that he's going to make the right choices. And you know what? He's also going to make the wrong choices and he's going to learn from them. But you did do a good job. I was just thinking here in that we just had a conversation the other day about like, oh my gosh, like we have the same pediatrician for like ever since he was a baby. And I'm like, what do we do when we have to switch to doctors? Who's going to like, where are we going to go? I didn't even like think about that. Like, and that's coming because he's going to be 17 soon. So yeah, just thinking about transitions. I'm just worried about getting to school this week, but like that's coming in, in the future for something that we have to think about. Yeah, and you know, it's coming. And the other thing that to think about just on that too is because Kaylee said it the other day, so that doctor didn't like me anymore, huh? That's why she's like her pediatrician when we had to switch because they basically say you can't go there anymore. So she's still in her mind. So we're, she's 24, but she still like thinks about it. They, she thinks the doctor didn't like her. And I'm like, no, the doc, you just got too old. You had to go on. But, you know, it's like you, how they feel. Anyways, just piping in. I want to make a suggestion for that. Um, I think uh, we, we could start preparing them before and let them know that this is, uh, they love rules, most of them, right? That at a certain age, the pediatrician is no longer going to be able to see you and we can start looking together and that way maybe empower them also to make the choice of who they like and say we can try different doctors and you tell me which one you would like now that you're becoming an adult right and and maybe that would help yeah we want to make them active participants right they're adults now um, in your instances Marsha and Shante um, people don't make choices for us in that manner. So we really need to empower them to make those choices too and, and let them know that it's okay to do that given the opportunities and the experience and exposure, but allow for them to make the ultimate decisions and some we're not gonna agree with and, and they're gonna learn from those as well. Um, but I am, I am gonna move on um, so that we can make sure that we get to hear all the stories. Bear with me as my trying to make it. Doesn't wanna, uh, we have some comments in the chat. Exciting, both for you and your son. Congratulations. And there's some very good, some are very good with technology so they can find doctors themselves. I love that. Very good point. And, and so much of the research we do to find our doctors is on the internet, right? Let's, let's use their strengths. Um, but we do just want to you know, bring it about now. We're, we're talking about individuals managing transitions best. And we know that we're the loved ones. What can we do to help these um, transitions go smoother? Um, first thing, establish those predictable routines and set those clear expectations. We wanna help our loved ones to manage and express their emotions. Um, these are valid. 
Um, we also realize that we have our own emotions that we need to manage at times um, and our own anxiety and stress for the changes that are coming about. We really wanna also have realistic expectations based on our loved one's development and their temperament. What can they truly handle? How much of this transition can we put on them at one time? We wanna encourage and reinforce our loved ones affecting, um, effective coping strategies. And we're gonna talk about this when we get into our stories, but we don't teach in crisis. Um, you were not learning in those moments. So how do we really help and plan for that and, and teach those coping strategies, those common strategies when our loved ones are feeling in those safe environments? And lastly, teaching strategies to handle stress and manage the actions and behaviors. Um, again, it's not just for our loved ones, but it's, it's for ourselves. We need to model the behaviors that we wanna see and to really help our loved ones get through these difficult, difficult times in many instances. Um, but I wanna talk about the first thing is establishing those predictable routines and setting those clear expectations. And so Molly, I wanna bring it to you because you had a great story about the first, sorry. <laughs> the first day of school. So, you know, tell us about that. I'm sure there's some families out there that not necessarily the first day of kindergarten, but coming back, um, Loris, you know, son is about to transition back to school. So tell us about the first day of school and, and how you made that so successful. I'll unmute myself. The first day of school is anxiety producing for everyone. Okay, for the parents, uh, leaving a child possibly this year for the first time in a very long time, uh, for the kids of what am I going to wear and do I have the right three ring notebook and the right color pencils and, and there's just a lot of anticipation towards this one big day and nobody sleeps well the night before and everybody's got to wake up at a different time and, and so there's just a lot of of factors that just go into making this day a bundle of possibilities of things that can go wrong. So one strategy that we used all the time was we had always got a long list of things that we needed to bring to school on the first day, you know, paper towels, hand sanitizers, um, all of the school supplies and all of that. We would go by school but when the teachers were there but before the students have arrived, drop off the school supplies, have my son know like, this is where your desk is gonna be. This is where you're gonna hang up your coat. Just those little things, plus not having to schlep all of the paraphernalia that's necessary for that first day, really just made things a lot easier. He was a lot calmer, I was a lot calmer. Um, and so that's just one very simple strategy we never asked permission. I've learned the teachers don't like that. And I'm a former teacher, so I should know that um, of just saying, we're going to just pop in for 15 minutes and drop some things off. Um, so that was a really effective strategy with my family. I think something you also brought up when we were discussing some of these before um, was the, the, the all about me cards, right? You talked about you know, what can, what information can I give the teachers about, you know, my child that is going to help my child and the teachers be successful? Because we don't want them to be set up for failure either. <laughs> right. 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 And so we used um, what I call a one page profile, and I'll put some examples in the chat, a links to some examples um, or an all about me, which basically tells what, what people like and admire about your child things that they should know, that the teacher should know. The other thing that I always did, and my child was part of the special education inclusion program, what I learned very often is I had a very well-meaning, um, typical uh, educator of typical kids who had a special ed inclusion kid. And about probably two or three weeks into school, I'd say, let's sit down and go over the IEP together and make sure that these goals still make sense. Um, and that way I knew that she, that teacher and I were on the same page about what my son's goals were and we're in agreement that that was okay. Cause typically you, the teacher who's, who's teaching the class has never been involved with the IP before. So I'm gonna put a link in the chat to some of those um, all about me and the one page profiles that can be really helpful with teachers. Do any of the participants have any strategies that they've used for their loved one when they were going to school or back to school um, that just help them either whether it's to relieve stress and anxiety or help that transition be more successful? Let's make that like, on right? I, I was gonna say, I used to like to, uh, well, and I still do, is check in with the other teachers and, and see like his like, for 
it used to be when he'd have uh, recess supervisors or like now with PE or different classes that he didn't always need special ed for that they were aware he had an IEP. And then we would kind of talk with either the teacher or now I can talk to him and tell him to talk to the teacher about accommodations so that they were aware of it. Because it surprised me how many of the teachers were not realizing he was in special ed because he was just showing up to class and getting through and not recognizing he needed like extended time and all of that stuff unless we either pushed for it or he advocated for it. So that's the other thing, not just like his special ed teacher, but also sharing what what your your child needs with the other people that are are with your kid during school. And it could be other teachers, it could be specials, it could be a lot of people that don't understand what what your kid gets. Yeah, and we have that downloadable form to the profile sheet. Um, but you can also, I, when my daughter was younger, I took it in, um, made copies of it and handed it to the PE teacher and all of the other teachers because um, you're right, they don't necessarily, they might be supposed to read the IEP, but they don't necessarily always do. And so it help, it's helpful for them to know certain things. So I agree with you. And as much as you can include your loved one in that too, like what do you want your teacher to know about you? What do you think didn't work well for you in last year and what do you want to be better this year? And have them, you know, actively partake in that. There was a question in the chat, Tara. Elaine is reminding us that transitions can be made fun and even exciting sometimes. And Flip says, Sophia from Facebook is looking for strategies to help her daughter find coping strategies when she's upset. Aside from ripping off all of her clothes. Uh, I also had a son, who, I also had a child who would not tolerate the, the feel of clothing on his skin was just too much. Um, and that's a sensory thing. Um, one of the, the strategies that I used were I, uh, I became a very good label reader of what fabrics um, seemed to breathe and feel good. My son was always hot. Um, and so, you know, sweaters and sweatshirts and things like that were just too hot for him. So I started looking at, you know, very natural fibers and things that wouldn't, wouldn't be irritating to him. Um, and he learned, uh, you know, sometimes as soon as he walked in the front door, he would, he would strip everything down and they were, they were left by the front door, but he eventually did learn, uh, to tolerate that while he was out in public. Um, we, I also, we also use a lot of like fidgets. So we have like a whole bunch of stuff that he, he can see he also has sensory issues that he can be touching and, and, um, and, and sometimes if I'm in a store and don't have something, um, just giving him a coin that he can rub because I usually have at least a penny or something in my wallet that like never seems to to go away, but I can pull that off. And that's like a quick, quick one um, if I need one. But we also like load his backpack. And if we go someplace, we always make sure that he's got something that he can touch instead of pulling out his clothes, you give him an, oh, it's kind of a replacement behavior, something he can do that he can still get that sensory sensation um, to redirect it to something that no one's going to have a problem with and that won't be as obvious as tearing off clothes. And I'll jump in on this one too. I see Claudia said that there are breathing strategies to use. I know this was also another thing um, similar, um, at least with anger and the expression and doing so appropriately. And one of the things that we've really worked on doing um, is, again, a preventative strategy. Um, or proactive, how about that, proactive strategy of identifying, I see that you're frustrated. And that has slowly over time become something where then she, my daughter becomes aware that she's feeling a certain way and then things don't go further. For us, it's the uh, fist clenched and rigid arms at the side. And I'll just say, I see that you're angry and your fists are clenched and she'll relax and relax her shoulders and then be able to start talking and we can get somewhere. I have a, another strategy that worked for my younger son um, who his autism really presented as anxiety and OCD and he has a lot of obsessive thoughts 
um, things that are very unrealistic, that the world's coming to, well, could be real, the world's coming to an end, things like that. And um, we worked with a cognitive behavioral therapist and part of our exercises were some of those breathing, breathing techniques. So he had it on his phone that he could go to listening to music. We identified all these self-calming strategies for him and um, exposure was some of that. So he had some scripting of these thoughts that he would read over and over, like for a certain amount of time. And it sounds really crazy, but it's that exposure piece that really, I, I think, um, let him realize that maybe some of his thoughts weren't as realistic and weren't going to become, they weren't going to be real for him. And um, he had a worry box. So if he had worry thoughts, he would put the worries in a box and that hopefully that they, you know, they would be disappeared and they wouldn't be apparent every day. So um, it was really helpful for him. And I think a lot of it was maturing for him. I mean, he started growing out of it at 18 or so, not, I wouldn't say growing out of it, but coping with it better. But that was something that really helped my family. Yes, thank you for sharing. And remember, all these strategies need to be practiced, um, you know, when they're calm. It's not, hey, here's a, you know, remember, here are all the fidget items that you can play with now that you're in this heightened state. It's when they're home every day practice, you know, and maybe it's the same time of day when they come home from school. This is when we're going to use that five minutes to just let's practice our breathing strategies. Let's get out that app. Let's really use this, these tools. Um, but there's, there's so much we can do, but I want to move on. Speaking of clothing, actually, I want to get to Claudia and I'm really talking about her son when he had his first sleepover and kind of what experiences he had there and maybe some areas we did well and some areas we could have done a little differently. Well, um, I, uh, there was a moment I never even thought that my son could be invited or, or anything like that to a sleepover. Um, and it doesn't have to be a sleepover with a friend. It could be a sleepover with a family member or, or your mom, your dad, but so things do happen. And, you know, I prepared him, you know, he's an eloper. So I, I, I taught him, you know, you, you know, you went over, you know, you leave the house, uh, you know, without asking permission at night, once you go to bed, you know, you're not interrupting, you're not going into somebody else's bed and all of that and, or somebody else's room, you know, don't, don't be so loud if you wake up before some other people, you know, the normal stuff. But <clears throat> so I drop him off to a friend's house and that's one of the tips too, that I, that you have to know who the person is. You have to know that, you know, talk to them about some of the potential things that they can do. Um, so this this family was very kind and, you know, the mom was an OT. So I, I felt very comfortable and they knew, you know, they had a son of the same age. I knew that that they knew each other for a very long time. So I let him go. And of course I, cut, I could almost not sleep that night for the next morning. And I go pick him up really early, you know, and. And I said, so how did it go? You know, and, uh, so she says, <laughs> she says, well, you know, at two o'clock, there was a lot of noise downstairs and we didn't know why he was downstairs. And when I asked him, he said, well, I'm a guest. So I was using the guest bathroom downstairs. And I was like, oh man, I forgot that, you know, I've been teaching him all these years that, you know, we don't go upstairs and go into other people's bedrooms when we go into a house that is not ours. We use the guest bathroom. So I was, Okay, it's so the first thing that I need to reteach, you know. And she says that, you know, being an OT, she she was really good. And she said, <laughs> she told him, you know, don't worry, Lenny, you know, if you're staying here, there's a new rule. You can use the bath the bathroom upstairs. Uh, if you're sleeping over, you're like family, so you can use the family bathroom upstairs. So he was okay and he didn't use the bathroom downstairs anymore. And I was like, okay, great. And she's like, but there's more. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Of course, there is more, right? <laughs> you know, so I ask, and I said, "Okay, I, do I even ask, right?" So I, she says to me, "Well, you know, he took a shower and he came up with, you know, after the shower, uh, undressed with like a tiny little hand towel in a cup in his private, you know, walking through the hallway nonchalant. <laughs> I can just imagine him, la la la, you know, like walking back." You know, and his friend saying, mom, you know, my friend is naked, you know. So um, apparently we forgot to discuss that, you know, you asked for a towel or I forgot to give him a towel to take. And, you know, and he found the hand towel and he used it to dry himself. And that's what he used to get <laughs> to get there. And I know as a behavior analyst, I could have taught to take a towel. I could have taught to bring your clothes, you know. 
spot was showing and thank God he found a little towel. You know? <laughs> so that was my one story there uh, for his first uh, sleepover. <laughs> You know, it's so, we plan so much, Claudia, and you, you know, you're a parent, you're a behavior analyst, you do these things, but what I found for us is we actually have to practice these things, like in that environment to really see what will my child be doing? Um, you know, what does it look like? Where is the bathroom, right? Will they be showering? What, what will happen there? And really kind of go through those motions with them um, to help them to be as successful as they can. But we, we can't always do that. It's just not practical. Um, but you know now, and you've learned for next time. So just thank you for sharing that story. And I know there are other panelists. I mean, how many of you have had your loved one pass through, a, you know, a home where they weren't fully clothed? Yeah, guilty. Yeah. How did that happen? All the time. Slipping <laughs> away on here, um, on the chat. It's lively. Um, yeah, so ours, thankfully it was grandparents. And so everyone was just like, uh <laughs> um but a, a bathroom was on the other side of the house and my daughter had forgotten her soap and her towel or something like that and so she just left the bathroom walked through the whole entire house to go get it <laughs> wait a second you need to wrap yourself in something put your clothes back on and then you can take the march across the well, and I will, my, my kids also did the same thing. And my brother used to say it reminded him of people in Sweden that, that are not hung up. They walk around naked all the time. So, yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, we went through, you know, those establishing those predictable routines and setting clear expectations. But now I want to look at um, teaching those strategies to handle stress and manage actions and behaviors. And I know, Elaine, this was something you were kind of asking about. And Claudia, I'm going to bring it back to you again, um, and this is going to be a, a puberty story, and, and this is, if, if you haven't experienced yet, for those of you on the call, you know, you're going to experience it, so what do we do in these times, and what were some of the frustrations that you had to kind of help your son overcome, Claudia, in, in dealing with puberty? So, you know, we had gone to the pediatrician, and I had taken some uh, puberty, uh, you know, pamphlets from there, and we had read them with my son and the analyst has read him. I am an analyst, but I still have an analyst for him. Um, you know, and, and, you know, we had gone through all of that and what he meant, but one day he was about 13 and he screamed, it was like 615 and he screamed, mom, I mean, across the whole house. And I just dart out of my bed and just go to his room. And I'm like, what's wrong? And he looks down and, and he says, take it off, you know? And here he had an erection and I'm, I, I mean, take it off, you know, and he just didn't want to have that on him and he didn't get it, you know? And so first I, that one second, you know, I took my mom hat and I did my ABA hat and I grabbed all my pamphlets and I sat and I said, okay, look, you know, remember we talked about this, you are going now through puberty. This is great. You're growing up. You know, I tried to make it as normal as possible. <laughs> I told him, you know, you're going to get hair here and, you know, in your axilla and your private area. And, you know, we've always been very open at really teaching, you know, since he's younger. So I was very, very happy that I could go over and I said, okay, and there's things you can do. If you're home, you can go into your shower and, you know, you can shower and make sure that, you know, it comes down. If you're not home, you know, you can start thinking of things like homework or, something that, you know, does, does not, you know, get to get your mind off of it and not elevators. My son loves elevators that would probably excite him. So I, I really look for something that would not, that would help him like, like homework or like, you know, like doing chores or something, you know, give him some visual because you can't just say, think of something else. No, you, I, you got to help him more, you know, so think of, think of homework, think of chores, think of, you know, walking the dog, things that I know will take his mind off. And he's not at all excited about that. I said, and if you don't want other people to see, and we want to, you know, cover up, take your shirt off, you know, and moving forward, we, we, we now took away all the shirts that were small and left the medium instead and said, you know, if, if, if that doesn't work, put your back up on your backpack, you know, in the other side. And, you know, here I am thinking, okay, great. You know, I cover all my bases. He went to take a shower. <laughs> we did great that day, you know, and then, uh, you know, as a mom, now I'm a mom again. And, 
you know, a week passed, a month passed, three months passed, and it never happened again. I thought, okay, in my brain, as a mom, he never got another erection, right? Okay, I, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, it's done. One time, we're, we're done. <laughs> so, but anyway, my daughter uh, one day had to go to school and she was going to get an award, you know, and so I told everybody, you know, I'm very good about transitions, you know, and telling them what I want and for when I want it. Like, so at three, Lenny, you shower at three 30, you come out, you, you get dressed by four. You're ready at four 15. We're leaving because there's no parking and we got to be there by five 15, you know? And so everybody, I told everybody the rule, <laughs> Lenny, is excited and and he goes into the bathroom at three and I 315, 330, 345. Now I'm um, I'm screaming, Lenny, get out of the shower. And he's not answering. At four, he's not out. So I go into his room and I go knock on the door and I'm like, Letter, what are you doing? Get out. And he screams back, I'm managing my erection. <laughs> so <laughs> Needless to say, my husband stayed home and I took my daughter. <laughs> I love that story, Claudia. And I know that there are so many people that can relate. And it's so hard too at times as the opposite sex parent. Like, how do we help our loved ones navigate these natural things in a way that isn't embarrassing for them, doesn't make them feel like dirty or shameful, and know that it's just this natural thing, but we do have to manage it. And if it's going to take you four hours in the shower, I'm sorry about your water bill. Sometimes that happens. Um, but I, I'm sure that there's a lot of people that can relate to, you know, the stories of, of puberty and just navigating all of that. And panelists, do you have anything to share on, on your puberty stories? Or you, me? Any? Sure. No, I do. <laughs> I was saying, does, any, does anybody else wanted to comment on, on Claudia's um, you know, the I mean, I think we could do a whole entire segment on puberty, and <laughs> I think it needs to be done. I, we haven't even talked about females and menstruation or masturbation, and <sighs> yeah, that's a whole that's a whole hour, hour and a half, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or <theory>. longer. <laughs> <laughs> but it can be done. So there's there's my segue into that. Um, uh, in the chat, we've got that um, Sabrina is, oh my goodness, we are going through hormones, mood swings, massive meltdowns. You know, that's another part of it is just the emotional back and forth. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of back and forth and emotions, um, Shantae, you had a story where you had planned, right? Everything was set up for this family vacation and this family trip where grandma was going to be involved and we had some issues. So kind of- Yeah, so- in there. <laughs> We had a last minute um, summer vacation and, um, you know, we hadn't gone anywhere all summer. So we were excited and I'm like, okay, let's just plan a little getaway like for a week and um, you know, not too far away. We don't have to fly because we have, you know, people worried about flying and that kind of stuff. So anyway, it's about three hours away. And um, I told my husband, okay, he was making the uh, hotel reservations. And I'm like, okay, make sure we have, um, you know, connecting rooms because that's what we found works with my daughter and, and, you know, grandma and her stay in one room and we stay in the other one, but we're connected. So everything's set. We get there, we drive, we're a little bit late. You know, it's, t it took us a little while, but by the time we got to actually get to the hotel. So it's in the evening time because we took our time. We get there and the uh, person at the checkout when we go to say, you know, get, check in, she's like, we don't have um, connecting rooms. And we're like, what? I'm like, what? And so, you know, that feeling when you get where you're just uneasy and I'm like, ah, should I, should I do it? Should I not do it? You know, should I try to see if we can do something else? What do we do? And um, I'm sitting there feeling this uneasiness and my husband's like, it's okay. She's 24 now. She can, she can do it. And I'm thinking, Oh, can she? Okay. Well, we'll try. Like, let, let her try. Okay. So I'm like, okay, we'll do it. So they're giving us a hotel room across the hall from my mom and Kaylee. And so we go and we set up and I'm thinking I'm doing everything the right way or preparing. I shouldn't say the right way, but I'm preparing, right? I've checked the pillows. I've checked this. I made sure the nightlight was plugged in. I do everything because my daughter has a little ritual of going to the bathroom every night um, 
getting up out of the bed and just going to the bathroom like 50,000 times a night. Now, whether it's really 50,000 times, no, but it's quite a few. So it's enough to annoy everybody. And normally in a hotel room, she turns the light on. So that's where we've learned to, okay, put the, put the night light on rather than opening the door and making noise. You can do it. Well, I forgot in all of this to remind grandma that this is a ritual. So I guess in the hotel room, grandma tried to control Kaylee and stop her from the ritual. And then things just escalated for two hours to the point that now it's like 12, 31 o'clock in the morning and we're getting a phone call waking us up out of a, um, a dead sleep saying, come get her. So, I can't hand, you know, she's not listening to me, come and get her. So we, we meet my mom in the hallway with Kaylee and both of them, Kaylee is like ready to like, she's in the hallway now it's one o'clock in the morning and she's ready to have a major meltdown and my mom's shaking. So I'm like, okay, I bring them into the, I, you know, kiss my mom goodnight, hug her. Cause I want her to be okay. She's, you know, elderly and we want everything to be okay. Get Kaylee in there. I didn't even say anything to Kaylee. Thank goodness we had um, a bed where we could pull out, you know, like the couch. And so she could sleep there. So we just put her to bed, get back in bed. And now we're both like, you know, our hearts are racing. We're, you know, a meth, but we're like, okay, just not, let's not discuss it right now. Let's just calm down. But then I realized oh, we don't have the nightlight. So we, the ritual is still going to go on now that she's in our room. So I turn on the light and I'm like, okay, great. So then I'm laying there, right? We're, and I'm just trying to be calm or trying to calm myself down. And and I'm and I'm sitting there almost like, you know, kind of praying, deep breathing, because I my stomach was in knots because I was like, oh God, please don't let her like, you know, have a meltdown because this is not, you know, and then and I'm thinking, okay, do we have to cancel the trip? Am I gonna have to go home? Are we gonna have to go home? Because, you know, if, if everybody can't sleep and we can't good sleep, we're not going to be able to have, do these fun activities. Everyone's going to be too tired and they're going to be, it won't be fun. So what, should we just go home? And so all this is going through my mind. And then, um, so, and then I was trying to think, okay, what, what could I have done? What could I have done better or changed or, so that's where I want your guys' help. I mean, we, it, she did sleep, thank God. We got to sleep that night and it did kind of, we were okay, but. I want help for future because I don't want to be doomed to never being able to take a vacation. And I want to kind of put some things in place. So I would like help on that. Shante, I think, you know, some of the things we need to consider, and it was brought up just a little bit ago, thinking about all the people that are in the environment that are going to shape the success or the failure of those experiences. Luckily for you, you had a family member that was a participant. So you could engage them in saying, this is my daughter's ritual. Um, this is what we're going, we're up against, like helping to manage your mother's frustration, right? Your daughter wasn't frustrated. She was fine in this. She got her ritual, you know, made every, your, your frustration wasn't really, you know, a, a concern to her, but it, it was, how do we manage those around us, right? We want to be invited back. That's the other thing. Oftentimes we're uninvited because, you know, our loved ones are causing this disruption to other people's routines. And so I would say pulling, pulling those other stakeholders in to the practice and, and the expectations and what they can do to help your loved one through these rituals that they have to have. And we are running a little low on time, so we can definitely talk more on that. And I know the panelists would, I'm sure, love to give you some more advice. Um, but I do want to get through a couple of more stories. So I'm going to um, do that if that is okay with you, ladies. Certainly. So we're looking good, but we're getting close. So I just wanted to look at, um, you know, one of our last slides is encouraging and reinforcing the behaviors we wish to see. Right? It's not just enough that um, we expect them, but how do we keep them going, that momentum and, and really letting our loved one know like you're doing it right, keep going, keep it up. And so Molly, I wanna bring it to you. You really had a, a good story with your daughter transitioning from like you know, school to home. What does that look like? And, and how did you help really navigate that? Right, and I think um, you know, I, I related to Shante's story um, and Claudia's story about, you know, you try to plan for everything. And I feel like of parents of kids with disabilities, like we plan a small event, like the invasion of Normandy. Like, do we have the nightlights and get your checklist and, and everybody's gotta be doing all this stuff. And, um, and we, we just want things to be okay for our kids, which is a natural thing for parents to wanna do. Um, and my story was about, you know, my kids, my daughter particularly, would hold it together at school. 
she was a great student at school. Nobody had any problem with her whatsoever. When she got home, we used to call it the after school dance. And the after school dance went like this. No, 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 mine, mine, mine. I won't, I won't, I won't. <laughs> um, because that was just a place where she could just let go. Um, school was exhausting for her and a lot of stimulation that she tolerated for as long as she could. And then when she got home, she really needed to be, and of course, I'm like the nosy mother, you know, tell me about school. What did you, who did you sit with? What'd you have, you know, who'd you sit with at lunch? And what did, you know, what happened? And I want to know, you know, every little thing, like, no, like I had to learn, like, mm, um, give her a little time. You're going to find out eventually, but you just have to sit, sit with and allow her her way to unwind. We all have ways that we unwind. I always think about when you get home from work, do you go automatically into your next task or do you change your clothes? Do you, do you, you know, have a routine that you have at home, get a snack, um, those kinds of things. Um, and so I think it's really important to recognize that our kids need that too. And I loved the, um, the little um, meme that Marsha found about, you know, like your kid has just arrived at their safe place and they need a little quiet time. Yeah, you're gonna, T Tara's gonna share that, I think, too, we have it on the screen, right? Yeah. The... I will do that now. Can see that. So I think sometimes we forget about, we think so much about the transition to school, we forget about the transition home from school and what that looks like. I agree. And thank you for sharing that because I think so many people think like, why can my kid not keep it together? The teacher says they're fine. They're, they're clearly not fine because when I have them, they're doing this dance. Um, but but it's, it's a real thing and they're keeping it together. They have those routines and those expectations and the peer models and everything is set so structured and they come home and they just have this relief and this release. And so I think it's so important that, you know, we really start helping them to prepare and reinforcing them for when they can get through that. We don't want to see that for them either. It can't feel good to have to go through that dance every day after school and, and feel like I just have to let it all out. I mean, it, it's not it's not a comfortable way to be. Um, right. And, and Claudia is reminding us, you know, as I said, we plan a, we plan any kind of activity like the invasion of Normandy. And she said, like, give the kids a checklist and allow them to do it. Um, so right. whatever you are doing, and I'm going to end on this because actually this is part of what we're going to talk about. But whatever you're doing for your child that they could be doing for themselves. I mean, that is something so important that we have to remember. Um, so, you know, some considerations I want to talk about are that transitions happen across all stages of life. Um, no matter how prepared we think we are, something else is going to come up. <laughs> and if you don't want to know, don't keep asking those questions. Um, we really need to plan for the unexpected. And the longer we're, you know, with our loved ones, the, the more experience and exposure we have, the more we're going to get better at this and planning for that. Oh, my God, I never thought about this. But here it is. Just when you thought you had it all, something else comes along. Um, remembering that we cannot teach in crisis. So we have to practice those coping and tolerance skills um, in isolation when our loved ones are calm. Make it a routine for them. Make it part of, you know, just as you brush your teeth every day, let's practice those coping and calming strategies. Um, we need to practice and rehearse skills across multiple people and environments using a variety of items. So let's say, you know, you've, you've got your Normandy is packed up, but you forgot your nightlight. Well, maybe there's a flashlight in the environment. Maybe there's a candle. Maybe there's some other way. There's a street light or a house light that you can turn on where I can still get the input that I need that is in a different you know, form. So thinking about helping them to be flexible. Allow your loved one to be part of the planning process. And this is, again, what is so important. Think about what you're doing for them now that they can be doing for themselves. If you are not here, if you have to go away for work or a business trip or you have to take care of your mother who has you know, fallen down the stairs now, what are they going to do in your absence? And we want them to be prepared. And as much as we think, well, I'm doing it for them so that they can you know, have everything they need, what they really need is to learn how to do it for themselves. So step back, all the little things you do for them, just, just wait, waiting is so important. See what they do um, and then start the prompting. And no matter how much we plan, circumstances can still go awry and situations um, you know, offer another learning opportunity and another chance to get it right. And like Flip said, you know, it, it, when all else fails, use humor to get you through those challenging situations. We, we know that um, life is not perfect. For the most part, the community is going to be understanding, um, not always, but for the most part. And if you can use humor, I mean, it's going to help you to lighten the mood and the mood and, and hopefully help your loved one through that as well. 
Um, we do have resources. These were being um, shared throughout the talk, but this is going to be also shared and posted for everybody that's on the chat tonight. And we did just want to end um, with a thank you to um, a mentor, um, to all of us who is no longer with us, Dr. Mimi Heineman. And, and Molly, you were going to read something, and I just want to you know, kind of leave on that note. Right. And I was actually thinking when Shantae was telling her story and she was talking about, are we going to have to cancel our vacation? Because, you know, we can't sleep in two hotel rooms and have everybody get along. We're, everything's off. Everything's over. And I, I was thinking this plays into so much into the work that Dr. Mimi Heineman did surrounding optimistic parenting and having those moments when you're like, you know, I'm never going to be able to go to the grocery store again. Um, and really thinking about, you know, there are some strategies and things that we can do to do this and, and really changing our mindset. And optimistic parenting was one of the things that Mimi worked really hard on. And I, I studied a lot of it. Um, so we have a sincere thanks to Dr. Mimi Heineman, who passed away from complications of breast cancer on August 5th. Like many of us in this field, Mimi started out working in group homes, got involved with schools as a behavior specialist, and as a staff member for the Center for Autism, a faculty member teaching courses in behavior management. She was the first director of Florida's PBS project and served as the co-training coordinator for the National Research and Training Center on Positive Behavior Support. You might be familiar with a lot of Mimi's research and books about optimistic parenting, practiced routines, mindfulness, and her long-term commitment to imp imp improving the life of families. She actually has a new book that's in press right now, along with Sarah Pfeffer, about parenting with PBS. And we could fill another whole webinar talking about Mimi's professional accomplishments. Um, Mimi's vision and commitment to excellence is what established Home and Community PBS in 2015 with a group of volunteers who valued the foundations of PBS uh, occurring that uses the science of applied behavior analysis and person-centered practices in messy settings like family homes and group homes and streets and restaurants and all of the places where your life happens when you're not in school. Mimi's drive towards excellence placed high expectations for home and community PBS developing academically sound products and reaching family members and direct support providers in ways that work for them. Mimi's networking also brought all of us together, uh, respected professionals, and joined with Parenting Special Needs Magazine, which enables thousands of parents to get important information on their own time. Mimi was the proud son, mom of two young adult sons, and we want to acknowledge and thank her as we carry on her commitment to providing positive behavior support strategies to families by doing webinars like this. So thanks everyone for being here and tribute to Mimi. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Mimi. So are there questions, comments? We still have a few attendees um, on the Zoom. I'm not sure how many are with us on Facebook. Any questions, comments, or thoughts you'd like to share with us before we all sign off? Or any help you want. Okay, I think everyone is ready for the next family chat on puberty. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. So we want to acknowledge our sponsors again, um, Positive Behavior Support. Um, corporation, parent to parent, um, partnership for people with disabilities, and um, home and community positive behavior support. And thank you all for sharing your stories with us. Um, thank you all for attending those that registered and, and, and were in attendance. And for those of you that on Facebook, and you can still put in comments, and we will put the um, different resources in the comments if the, it's probably already been done, but if not, we will yeah, add them that. after. It's been done. Okay. Well, I can't thank you ladies enough. Thank you for sharing um, some great information uh, that we can use. And um, thank you everybody for sharing. I appreciate it. All right. Goodbye. Good night, everybody. Thank you. And we'll see you next time.